Assalamu alaikum and jazakallah for taking the time to tune in to this week's Anur the Light. The Bukab is Islam's oldest established Muslim community in South Africa and has recently been facing the ever present threat of gentrification head on. During this year's Ramadan, they embarked on an awareness and protection campaign to highlight what's been happening there. The Bukab is home to the oldest Muslim community in South Africa. It was established over 300 years ago and became the home of freed slaves as well as skilled artisans who settled here and contributed their services to building Cape Town. These days, it is under threat as property prices are rising and after years of trying to negotiate with the city official, the community is taking a stand. This particular Bukab area is where Islam found its roots in this particular area. This is what we call the cradle of Islam. This is where Tuanguru Abdullah ibn Qadi Abdul Salam, when he was banished from Indonesia, was imprisoned in Robben Island more than um, 250 years ago, came into this particular area and he started the Muslim community in the historical workup. During the holy month of Ramadan, residents organize a mass booker in the streets and use this to bring attention to the issues they are facing. I'm here this evening to support the cause around all the issues that have been manifesting itself in the book up over the last couple of years. And we find our youth, our civic associations, other groupings within Bukab who've just said enough is enough and they're standing up against the multiplicity of issues that we're facing in the area, ranging from gentrification to commodification of the area. Um, there's issues around the city of Cape Town and the rates issues. Um, the mass Buka is, is, like I said, to mo mobilize the people to get that love amongst the community back. And, and inform the people of, of developments currently running because there are quite a few uh, new innovations where tourism is concerned, uh, the, they're affecting our parking, they're affecting our privacy and I think it's the right time to say no, enough is enough so we need to take our book up or our community back. The Buka for Buka happened every Friday evening and urged people from all walks of life to join the Muslim community in breaking the fast. We as the Book Up Youth Committee, we want to show that there is a way to have a peaceful protest, to have respect, to have people come in a manner from with all ages, cultures, religions and support us. Um, what Islam is, to unite people, to show people that we can demonstrate in a peaceful manner and bring people together and achieve results at the same time. Um, we just need the right people to hear us and give us the results that we need, that we want to preserve our heritage, our cultures and our traditions. We don't want to lose that because soon if everybody does take over, the developers do take over, we won't be left with much. A platform was created and speakers were invited to show their solidarity with the residents of the area. It became a rallying cry, not only for the Bukab, but for many of the dispossessed communities of Cape Town. The Bukab had a special place in my grandfather's heart. This is because of its unique history and the place it occupies in our long walk to freedom. It is a history of defiance, and struggle against slavery, oppression, and injustice. Last week, President Ramaphosa asked to declare Woke Up a national heritage site, to protect this historic site. Young people are taking the lead as they did in 1976, as they did in 1980, but this time they are saying we are trying to preserve the quality of our freedom because we are saying that even in conditions of freedom and democracy, these are the hardships that we face, the gentrification of this area to remove our heritage from the Bwaka, and that is why your fight is such an important one. For many people, Bukab is not only a symbolic home, but the heart and soul of Islam in South Africa. People are taking note and through this protest, making their voices heard. If you look at what's happening in Bukab for the last five or six years, there's an ethnic cleansing done in a professional manner, in a very subtle manner. They do it by means of raising rates and taxes. People that have inherited these prop properties 
from their great great parents and these people have to let go of their properties because they cannot afford the rates and taxes being charged in these areas uh, we are calling for a heritage protection overlay of this particular area so that you know um, the buildings is the one thing but at least the culture the tradition of um, the muslims um, is uh, preserved as the city continues to gentrify neighborhoods a unique social fabric that existed is slowly disappearing the people and area survived slavery and apartheid but democracy and the current provincial government look set to relegate its place in the city of cape town to the history books it will be a sad day when this age-old community is relegated to the history books because of the city and the provincial government's refusal to grant it the necessary protection it deserves. Molina Baum is ready with this week's Q&A. <laughs> Respected viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We begin by praising Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and salutations be upon all the messengers of the Almighty and those who follow them in goodness and righteousness. Welcome back to our program, the Q&A segment of the Annur. Today amongst the questions that we have, one is a sister asking, my family has invited guests over on the day of Arafah. And so my parents have told me that none of us can fast on that day because it would make the guests feel uncomfortable. What should I do? It's an important aspect that in our Sharia there are perspectives. There are also priorities, there are aspects of wajibat, things that are compulsory, things that are optional. And we have to have and keep that perspective in mind when we deal with our issues. The aspect of keeping of fast on the day of Arafah is definitely recommended. It is something that our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given great amount of rewards with regard to it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, whoever fasts on the day of Arafah, it is hoped that the entire minor sins of his of the previous years will be forgiven. However, it is not a compulsion. It is an optional fast. Now, for the sake of an optional fast, it is not worthwhile that we create disputes in the family. So discuss the matter with the family to find a reasonable solution. Both the issues are correct from a Shari perspective. If, for example, a person doesn't fast, there is nothing wrong with it. He is not committing anything that is haram. If, for example, you discuss it with the family members that I would like to fast, I won't make it any way difficult and make the guests feel uncomfortable. There are many instances in our history where people kept fast, but yet they provided meals for those people uh, who are in need of meals. Keep in mind that this is an optional fast. For the sake of an optional fast, it is not worthwhile to create disputes in the family. Find a reasonable solution within the family uh, with regard to the issue. A second question is, I'm an educated female. I'm teaching in university. Can I perform Hajj on my own without a mahram because I don't have any mahram to take me for Hajj? My parents have also given me permission to go for Hajj. There are two views with regard to this. According to some schools of thought, we have to go with a mahram. However, according to other schools of thought, in particular, the school of Imam Shafi Rahmatullahi, it is permissible for a woman when she is in a group of other women and they go together for Hajj. Even the Saudi authorities have acceded to this. So if a woman is without a mahram, and she goes with a group of people within one group. For example, you take a group and there are a lot of people who are there in that group and you join that group, then Imam Shafi Rahmatullah Ali has given the opinion that it is permissible. Keeping this in mind, in your situation, as you have no mahram to go for hajj and you want to go, your parents have given you permission, then you should join a group and using and joining that group, you should go and perform your hajj in the situation and circumstances that you find yourself. Another question is, what is the ruling for praying in a moving vehicle such as a train or an aeroplane? Now, it all depends on the situation and circumstances. If it is within our means and within our capacity, then we should be able to pray. When many a times in the trains and in the air, the airline officials and the people who are in the air, they make accommodation with regard to it, provided 
we approach them in a respectful way and we perform our prayers at a time which is not inconvenient and it is not forbidden. For example, if you have to go and insist on performing prayers at a time when people normally are landing or about to you know, take off, it's not, they're not going to allow you. So be reasonable with regard to it, it is permissible. Find out where the Qibla is and perform your prayers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Jazakallah for joining us on the Q&A segment. Right now, there are more than 2 million people making their way to Mina where they will set off on their Hajj. The journey is incumbent on every Muslim who is by the means and we spoke to some South Africans who are undertaking the pilgrimage. Hajj, the holy pilgrimage, is one of the five pillars of Islam that asks of every believing Muslim person who is by the means to perform this journey. It takes place in the holy city of Mecca over a period of five days during the month of Dhul Hijjah. People come from all over the world to fulfill their duty and start their life anew. So 2012, uh, Shamsa and myself decided, yes, we need to start registering now so that we can start preparing to go for our, our Hajj. We then started checking every six months to see, uh, you know, if we were accredited. Beginning of 2018, we then received an SMS. It was like a dream come true, put it that way. The Saudi Arabian Hajj Ministry has determined a quota system for countries to adhere to. This is administered locally by the South African Hajj and Umrah Council and requires prospective pilgrims to register for Hajj. Sahuk is the South African Hajj and Umrah Council, um, established in 1995. Our role in the Hajj industry is basically the administrator and regulator of the Hajj industry per se. When we talk about regulator, we regulate Hajj operators per se from a perspective to ensure that only accredited Hajj operators are those entities that are going to be able to take Hujjaj to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to embark on this religious and auspicious journey of Hajj. In addition to that, we facilitate the visas that have basically been handed down by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's Ministry of Hajj to the South African um, Hujjaj in order to ensure that an equitable and transparent process of queue for those that are eligible to perform Hajj is undertaken. Pilgrims start their journey long before stepping on the plane. Once they've received the call up to attend the Hajj, there are many preparations to be done beforehand. We need to see that our families is seen to, our kids especially. There's lots of preparation, seeing that everything is in place whilst we are gone. The greeting of our families, I think that is the most emotional part, is to not knowing that you will come back or not. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, my husband said, when my mother-in-law and my father-in-law come back from Hajj, they talk to us about, you know, uh, how they make it Hajj. Now I'm just waiting to go. You know, because I'm very excited. Everything was ready for us. It was just that accreditation that we were waiting for. Apart from the accreditation of pilgrims, the South African Hajj and Umrah Council are also responsible for ensuring travel companies meet the required standards. I think the first and most important factor is that everybody cannot be an operator. Everybody can't be a doctor. Everybody can't be a lawyer. So those people who have been involved in the Hajj industry and who have the credentials and the ability to take people for this pilgrimage of Hajj are then accredited by SAUG through a very extensive process. Um, to be an accredited Hajj operator, you must be accredited with the Hajj mission, SAUG. Also, you need to have um, all contracts with hotels in Medina and Makkah. And also, you need to have at least um, five years' experience. Everybody who is involved in that Hajj operating company needs to have the relevant experience. The processes in the kingdom are even more strenuous than the processes in South Africa. Okay, once the client's booked and confirmed, they choose which date they want to go, which package they're taking. We confirm hotels for them. Then the, uh, we start applying for visas. Once everything is back from the embassy, we call the client. They come in, collect, brief them on their entire trip. And yeah, they're good to go. Hajj is a journey of a lifetime for the believer. 
It is also a business that has boomed in recent years, but the core of what the pilgrim has to do remains. The highlight for all is the day of Arafah, where it is said, the whole of humanity will be gathered on the day of judgment to hear their fate. Pilgrims who are present here are absolved of all their sins and return home like a newborn baby, thus gaining a second chance spiritually. <laughs> The stories I hear from pilgrims are always so heartwarming. And inshallah, one day I too will make the journey. Here is a Quranic tafsir on Hajj. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim الحج أشهر معلومات فمن فرض فينا الحج فلا رفث ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج وما تفعلوا من خير يعلمه الله وتزودوا فإن خير الزاد التقوى والتقون فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتٍ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ عِنْدَ الْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ وَاذْكُرُوهُ كَمَا هَدَاكُمْ وَاذْكُرُوهُ كَمَا Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you. The beautiful recitation addresses a verse in chapter 2 of the Holy Quran that speaks of the journey of Hajj, a physical pilgrimage from our homelands to the Holy Lands. But this verse uniquely speaks about a pilgrimage from all that is negative as well from all that is vile, from all that may be wrong. فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَثْ وَلَا فُسُوق وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ Whosoever undertakes this beautiful journey, physically moving from place to place, should abstain from all vile talks, all mischief and unnecessary arguments, or arguments per se. And whatever you do of good, he knows of it. He, the Creator, knows of it. We prepare for this journey, but the best of preparations is God consciousness. It speaks of life, the journey of life. If I want success and want to be successful in this life, I should look at all that is positive all the time and do my best, even though I may falter and slip and trip, I should do my best to come back and live a wholesome life. Moving physically from place to place is good, but it's representative of my journey of life. I, I, I enter this world and I'll be leaving it. In between, I should conduct myself in the best manner possible to gain maximum benefit from my stay here. And this is an intelligent person's attitude at life. And therefore, the verse ends with, 
وَاتَّقُونِ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Those who will take heed of this note, those who will take heed of this message, are truly those of intelligence. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are praying for a Hajj Mabarur to all pilgrims who are attending the Hajj this year. On a lighter note, Lamis has a yummy recipe ready and waiting. Assalamu alaikum. Today we're cooking Thai and one of my favorite dishes, and that is sweet basil chicken fried rice. So the ingredients that we need are the following. I've got three tablespoons of oyster sauce. I've got two tablespoons of fish sauce. I've got about a half a cup of peanut oil. And then I've got some soy sauce, which essentially is our salt substitute. I've got two serrano chilies, finely chopped. I've got six cloves of garlic that I've chopped roughly because you still want the crunch of the garlic. I know it's not too much for this dish. And then I've got a heaped teaspoon of red chili powder. And then I've got a tablespoon of white sugar. I've got no, just your usual salt and pepper for seasoning if we need it but we'll taste as we go along. I've got some cilantro and I've got a cup and a half of sweet fresh basil. Then I've got about four chicken fillets that I've just thinly cut into strips and then I've got one red pepper finely sliced and I prefer to dice my onions. And then of course the rice that we all have in the back of our fridges, white rice, don't salt your rice in this case. If it's already salted, it's fine. Just hold back on your soy sauce, but make sure it's cold. The secret to fried rice is cold rice. So what are we gonna do first? Peanut oil into a hot wok. And I'm gonna start off with my chilies because the hot oil will allow all of that delicious hot flavor to be released. The chili oils will come out and immediately I add my garlic. In goes my chicken. And now you want to make sure that this gets coated really well. And the reason why you use peanut oil or sesame oil in this case is not only for the flavoring, but because it can take such a high heat. Sunflower oil would burn. So now that my chicken is just cooked, I'm going to pop in my onions. And again, you want this to go at a high heat so it maintains its sweetness with just a little bit of crunch. Give this a quick stir. And to this we add our peppers. Okay, so in goes my oyster sauce. So oyster sauce out of all your Asian sauces would probably be the closest to your stir fry sauce. So slightly sweet and thick fish sauce, great preservative, smelly all on its own, but a great salt substitute. A little bit of soy, mostly to color my rice. My red chili, because we love that heat in Thai food, together with the best part in Thai food, and that's the sweet. Give this a quick toss around. So the basil leaves that I've got are quite big. So what I'm gonna do is just tear them up as I put them in. And this is just gonna keep it rustic and real. And I'm going to add some black pepper to this. Just a sprinkling of salt, because remember, my rice is not salted at all. Just love how bright and vibrant Thai food looks. And now, the best part, the rice. So all of this literally just gets dunked in, and you're going to move this around until it's sucked up all of those delicious flavorings, and it's gone a nice sort of brownie color. So once the rice has absorbed all of those delicious juices, make sure you taste for the sweet, salty, and the strong. And I'm just gonna bring my dish closer. And what I've got is my favorite way of serving food, family style. And now all this needs is a sprinkling of cilantro, some chopsticks, and friends to share. So until next time, assalamu alaikum. As we take leave for yet another week, the team and I would like to wish each and every Muslim a blessed Eid al-Adha. Assalamu alaikum from me, Zahra Robinson. Mm -hmm.